it is our pleasure to be joined by the best NFL draft analyst in the game, people. You see his face all over ESPN these days. Matt Miller is in the house. What's going on, man? Man, I sh- I knew I should have wore bur- burnt orange today. I knew it. <laughs> I knew uh, it. But, uh, you know, I had some other media to do before you guys, and I wanted to look professional. So just know that it's it's in here in my heart. But I'm happy to be on with probably my two favorite Oklahoma Sooner- Sooners of all time. So that. That means a lot. You you are a <laughs> Longhorn, and maybe, maybe we'll touch on that later yeah. in the interview, Matt. But I just wanted to jump in to the OU guys with you, and clearly the conversation has to start with Tyler Guyton. Yeah. This is – it's a very talented offensive tackle class in this year's draft. Where does Guyton kind of stack up amongst the group for you? Yeah, I mean, he's my number 20 overall player. That has him at, like – OT four, I think right now is where he's at. So, but he's in that mix, you know, like Joe Alt from Notre Dame is going to go really early. And then I, th- I think it is a question of who goes next, you know, Olu uh, Fashionu from Penn state. We think he's probably the next guy off the board, but you know, there are a lot of question marks about each of those players. I think for Tyler, you're looking at someone who, you know, uh, something you guys can appreciate a former defensive lineman, you know, who transitions to the offensive side. He's only got 14 starts in college, but those 14 starts are all really good. And I, I think you can look at some of the guys he went up against in the Big 12, and he was one of the only people who could handle them. And so the tape is limited, but really good. And so, you know, he's more of like a quote-unquote developmental prospect just because he hasn't played a ton of football. And I think that's that's crucial on the offensive line. You know, it's probably the two positions in football, quarterback and offensive line, where the more football you play, the better you're going to get at it. You're just naturally going to settle in. So that's – that's the big question mark for him. He's not alone in this draft class like that. You know, Amarius Mims at Georgia only has eight starts. So it's a, a limited amount of starts for these guys. But, you know, I, I think he has a – depending on, you know, how the interviews and things go, he's got a, a great shot to be a top 20 pick. You think – you know, you mentioned there's some good tackles in this draft that are rated really high. Is is this one of those years where uh, you see a kind of a run on a, on a certain position? Like – I guess what I'm saying is, how, yeah. how do you think the tackle position rates this year to where people may be jockeying for positions to scoop one of these guys up? Yeah, it rates really, really well. And I think, you know, just looking at the way the board stacked this year is interesting. Um, I can tell, I think I have like eight offensive tackles that could be drafted in the first round. It's, it's wild how much talent there actually is at, at the position this year, especially if you add in guys like uh, Fatanu from Washington. You know, it's like, hey, he might be a tackle, might be a guard. If you count him, I have eight tackles in my top 32 players. And then the way that the board falls, when you actually look at team needs, like the Titans at seven, they will be taking a tackle. Uh, The Chargers could at five, honestly. So first tackle could come at five. Next one at seven. The Jets could certainly take one at 10. Um, You know, so there's a, a lot of room for teams to take tackles in the top. 16 picks is the way it looks right now. Um, and then, you know, even in the 20s, you have a lot of teams that, like the Steelers need a right tackle, which, you know, Guyton and and several of the tackles this year are guys who've only played on the right side. Um, you know, the Steelers could use one. The Dolphins could use a, you know, developmental guy. I think the Eagles have to at least start thinking about, like, the life after Lane Johnson, after watching Jason Kelsey retire. It's something that you've got to have in the back of your head, and they've drafted – They've always drafted ahead at positions. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if they did that again this year, but they're D- Dallas at 24, another team that needs a tackle. So it was a position that kind of got neglected in free agency this year. And there's also a lack of talent out there at the tackle position. So I think that that bodes well for not just Tyler, but all these tackles that they could end up going, you know, even a little bit higher than where they're graded because of that need. Is Guyton one of these guys that, Teams look at him and and you use the word project, but it's just he's he's not fully developed physically. It, it, is it possible yeah. that teams could view him as the the tackle with the highest ceiling in this entire draft? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, because like Alt is Alt will be the first tackle drafted, barring a gigantic surprise. But he, you know who he is. He's been in Notre Dame for three years. You you know exactly what that guy is. You know they're going to max you out. Same with J C Latham at Alabama. They're going to get every bit of football talent out of you at those schools, at those positions. So I think with Guyton, because of the position change and because of the relative newness to the to the position and his athletic ability, I, I don't think that would be a stretch. It would be him or Amarius Mims from Georgia. Uh, you know, Mims is a, a similar type guy, but you know had 
to wait his turn behind Broderick Jones, who was a first round pick last year, gets to start this year, has the ankle injury. So he misses some time. I think for Guyton, it's more of like, he's a little farther ahead, but you still see that upside because he's, he's got really like a, a rare body type because the length, he's a lean guy, despite how big he is. And, and you, you can see it, you see the athleticism of why he used to be on defense where now it's more like reactive agility where it used to be that, you know, the explosion. Now he's able to do that and, you know, stay in recovery situations at tackle, which is, is really impressive. Might as well stick with tackle. Walter Rouse, you know, transferred to Oklahoma from Stanford. You know, just whenever we were doing our pro day coverage, watching him go through everything, I kept saying, I, I think he's like the easiest draft pick ever. Now, I don't know how high he goes. Yeah. But. You know, the dude is a Stanford graduate, super smart, ton of experience. Uh, he's got a, you know, he's pretty athletic, can play multiple spots. Like, what do you think of Walter Rouse? Yeah, I think, you know, he, you know exactly who he is. Like we were saying with some of the other guys, when you've gone through Stanford and OU, you've been developed as an offensive lineman over those five or six years. So that's a, a good thing for him. I have him right now. I was trying to look at my notes and cheat and look over there. I have him in the fifth round. Some of that's just, you know, Limited athleticism, I, I think, is is the note that showed up most for me. But, um, you know, I, I think there's so much value in finding that third tackle. Uh, I was talking to an O-line coach last week, and he's like, you know, we don't draft backup centers, but we'll draft four backup tackles. And, we'll, you know, because you can find a, set, a tackle who can play guard. You can find a tackle who can probably snap the ball a little bit. And it gives those guys a lot more value. And I think he falls into that category, too, of, you know, super experienced, as you mentioned, a heady player. And he has experience at left tackle, could play right tackle, no problem. And so that, that is going to get you drafted. There's a lot of those guys this year. I think it's the, the kind of the interesting situation because of COVID year was expiring for some people. Um, you know, so we've got five and six year players who really had to enter the NFL. And there's, so there's a lot of experience outside of the first round of tackle. He kind of falls into that group that's, you know, we're going to, put 15 names in a hat and he might go in the fourth round. Whereas a guy I have in the fourth is going to go in the fifth because teams are just going to value that experience a little bit more. Yeah. I've, I've talked a lot about Rouse on here, Matt, and I, I'm with you on the athletic limitations. And that's why I would not be shocked to see him starting at guard for some team down the road. Yeah. I, I just don't know. I, I don't know how many teams are going to view him as a tackle only type of guy and we'll, we'll see, but he's definitely the type of guy you want to have on your roster now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially that arm length. Yeah. You know, like over, that was over surprising. 35 inch arms, you're probably getting drafted. Like you just, nothing else really matters at that point. It's like, yeah, we're, we're going to work with that. Well, and when you've been at Stanford and OU with 35 plus arms, you're, you're making the NFL. I, I completely agree with that. Now, Andrew Rain's an interesting prospect. He's played a lot of football, had some injuries throughout his career. I thought he had a he had a decent week at the Senior Bowl, but he, he did not impress at the Combine. Yep. What is what, what's your evaluation of Rain? Yeah, I put a backup grade on him. I, I think he's you know in that sixth, seventh round range, probably uh, just because of the Combine. If we were talking about tape and Senior Bowl. It maybe would have been a little bit higher. Um, I, I don't have the number right in front of me, but I know he ran uh, above five four. Um, so at his and he's not. If he were three hundred forty pounds and ran a five four, you'd be like, okay, we, that kind of makes sense. But he's not. You know, he's not an oversized interior lineman to where you would expect that. And then his ten yard split is something that is really important to me for interior offensive linemen. His ten yard split, I believe, was one of the worst of any of the offensive tackles. So that or offensive linemen, excuse me. So that. That worries me quite a bit, but yeah, again, you know, he, he'll get drafted. He's going to play in the NFL. Um, I don't see anything on him that says he's going to slip through the cracks and be a starter, you know, because usually those are the guys they slip through the cracks because they're a little bit undersized or maybe they, you know, moved around a decent amount in college, but they have almost like a, a hallmark trait that you can hang your hat on, you know, like, my God, did you see that guy's three cone time? Okay. We know that the short area quickness and balance are going to be out of this world. We'll work with that because he you really came under the bar on all the athletic testing. That's where you start to get in trouble a little bit. Maybe the uh, the most interesting one, or at least around here, that everyone's going to have their eyes on is Drake Stoops. You know, yeah, incredibly productive. 
you know, didn't get a senior bowl or combine invite, but, you know, there were some good reps that he had there at the East West Shrine game. Obviously, like I said, super productive. You know what you're going to get from him. I, is there a chance he gets drafted? I think there's a chance, and here's and I we probably should have started with this about some of these day three guys. This is the shallowest pool of draft talent that I've ever covered. So I think it was it was last year, or the year before was the deepest because we had all these guys who lost eligibility or had that extra eligibility from from COVID. So this year turned out being the shallowest because only 54 juniors entered the draft, and so many guys were able to say hey, well, actually 2020 didn't count for me, so I'm going to go back for one more year. This will be the last year that, that anyone had that COVID eligibility. So this is a really shallow draft pool. Like normally I have to cut my list to 700 players. This year I can't find 500. So it's it's really a different type of year. That's great news for Rouse, Rame. Great news for Drake Stoops because just your list of players to draft is a hell of a lot smaller this year. And so, you know, we can make all the Nepo jokes we want. That stuff matters. We all know it does. And so having those connections, having the production, all that's going to help. So, you know, if you're the Dallas Cowboys at pick, you know, 243 or whatever, you're like, we got to make one more pick. Uh, Stoops. Okay. Yeah. He had a million catches in college. He can be a core special teams player. Yeah. We'll get him on, on the roster. And there's dudes like that on every NFL team. So this isn't just like hypothetical, like, it happens every year. You know, there was a kid at BYU a couple of years ago who was just like catching passes at Zach Wilson's pro day. He's the punt returner for the Chicago bears now, I think. So it's like those guys always seem to just like make it in the league. And I, I think Stoops is that way too. Would have loved to have seen, you know, a combine workout. I was really surprised he didn't make that list. Uh, but it was, I, I think this was the most receivers that had ever been drafted or selected for the combine. So that, that it was just a numbers game at that point. Any other OU guys that you view kind of as draftable players? Jonah Laulu was a guy that turned some heads at Pro Day with his size and length and, yeah. and some of the testing numbers he put up. Isaiah Coe did some good things, but do, do you have any other Sooners that you think may slip into that, you know, late day three area? Those are the only guys I've watched so far. Um, you know, peek behind the curtain this last month, you would think would be like, oh, you're just talking about Caleb Williams every day. I'm actually like watching day three prospects all day, every day to make sure that there aren't, you know, guys like that who pop off at pro day. And I'm like, okay, wait, I didn't have you on my list. Let me add you and, you know, try to watch five or six games and then talk to some scouts to see, you know, what their opinion is because it's all about time management this, you know, right now. So it's how much, how many days do I spend on a player that might not get drafted? Right. So, I mean, I guess we could talk Caleb. That's one Oklahoma player that, that we haven't talked to. I don't know. Oh, how. Wow. How wow. that works. You just had to do it, huh? <laughs> well, I actually don't know. You know, some places like Russell Wilson still reps NC State. You know, so I don't know how that works for, hey, for everyone. When when he when he insulted Texas, what was that after the season, Ted? He had that after one tweet. Season, uh, yeah. Although you fans were like, he he may still be He's one still of us. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to talk to Caleb at the combine. It, it, unexpectedly, it wasn't scheduled. He just, he came by the, the ESPN set and I was the only analyst there. So we talked for a little bit. I'd never spoken to him before. I loved the kid and I didn't have any preconceived notions. I, I've been, you know, pretty just, you know, staying out of the, the conversations about who he is off the field. Cause I hadn't met him yet, but I, I absolutely loved him. And Everyone I've talked to says the same thing. You know, they said, so man, he's he's like a good kid. He's And I know things didn't go the way Oklahoma fans wanted them to. I was very happy to see him leave. But, um, you know, it's it's still like, you know, you've got a, a guy who was there for one year and made a, a hell of an impact. Well, I, I'm interested in, like, what happens to him in the NFL because I don't think he developed hardly at all in college. As a player, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, he he hangs on to the ball way too long. He he's almost waiting to get outside to scramble to try and create something down the field. Now, I know he's totally capable of of staying in the pocket. He's got a great arm. He's got great touch and accuracy. I mean, he checks the box everywhere. I'm just wondering if he is going to go to the NFL and still feel like he can extend every play for eight seconds. And I'm just yeah. curious to see how that, that develops. Are people worried about that? 
Yeah, you have to be. And I think it's the question of, did you do that out of necessity or is that just your game? You know, and that's, that's the hard part. And this is not a shot at Lincoln Riley. I respect the hell out of him as a coach. He's, he's great. His offense um, produces big plays and great numbers. And he's produced, you know, he'll have three first overall picks at quarterback if you, you know, after Caleb selected. So, but those guys have struggled in the NFL to some, you know, Baker struggled, Tyler has struggled. And so that offense, while, you know, high octane in college and super explosive, doesn't really prepare guys for the NFL. There's a lot of learning that they still have to do once they get there. You know, we could say the same about Cliff Kingsbury's offense. You know, I, this is something that I've talked to my homes about of like, you know, what was that year one where you're not playing like, and it was like, well, I was, it was kind of learning how to play quarterback, you know, like all the tools were there, but I'd never taken a snap under center. I'd never called to play in the huddle. And so for Caleb, like it might not be that stuff of like, oh, it's the verbiage, but it is definitely going to be Teddy that I can't hold the ball for seven seconds. I, you know, he had eight fumbles last year. That was, that's a lot for a quarterback. You don't want, you don't want to see that. So, you know, he's going to learn that lesson or he's going to have someone like you tackling him very early in his week one, whoever the bears play, they're going to eat him up if he's trying to do that stuff back there. So, you know, you can get away with it to some degree. I'll never forget my scouting report on Mahomes saying the things he gets away with in college, he won't get away with in the NFL. And he does. And I was wrong, but you know, he's like one of one. You know, it's that he's the dude that broke the mold. So I don't want to say Caleb can't do some of those things because now there's a precedent of someone who plays like that. But he would be one of two in the NFL who's who's living like that, getting away with it at a high level. So I think it's it's pretty clear at this point that Caleb Williams is going one to the Bears. There's a lot of discussion about the the other quarterbacks in this draft class. How do you rank the other QBs that could possibly go in round one, Matt? Yeah, so I have Caleb pretty firmly in a tier by himself. Then I actually have Jaden Daniels, a little bit of a drop to Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, and then I think Bo Nix and Michael Penix are in there as well. So we we probably see four, but we could see as many as six, depending on medicals for Michael Penix Jr. and interviews for Bo Nix. You know, he can make some team fall in love with him, and we see him get drafted a little bit higher feels like there's, you know, those happen, you know, Mac Jones, Daniel Jones, like there's a lot of guys who, you know, make a team fall in love with them because of desperation. But, you know, I, I think Caleb's in a room by himself. And then Jaden, I, you know, I don't know how many people watched LSU this year, but he was the most improved player in the country, not just the best player in the country, the most improved player in the country. Like turn that Florida game on when the dude had 600 total yards of offense against an SEC defense. Like say what you want about Florida. 600 total yards against an SEC defense is pretty damn impressive. And so, you know, what he became as a downfield passer while still being able to utilize the run is just, it's where the game's going, you know, like look at what Lamar Jackson does. Look at what Kyler Murray does. You know, that's, that's who Jaden Daniels can be. Uh, Staying on the quarterbacks for a second. Now we're talking about the Caleb Williams and the transition and, and Lincoln Riley's offense. You know, it was interesting. There's been some chatter that, Spencer Rattler, you know, he went to South Carolina and did run an NFL style offense. And it sounds like maybe that's caught some people's attention. It helped him. It really did. And I I was actually, um, I was at two pro days last week, Ohio state, Michigan. And I ended up talking about Spencer Rattler to an NFL scout. And he was like, you know, the last two years really helped him a lot, not just as a player, but off the field, you know, he had, he had to grow up. And I think some of the, you know, some of the, star studded you know like oh i'm the number one quarterback in the country i'm gonna be a first overall pick i'm gonna win a heisman he had to really kind of take one on the chin when he left oklahoma or even when he got benched at oklahoma you know and learn how to be a teammate to maybe you know for the first time ever and I i think everything i've heard is that you know he grew up on and off the field he had to learn how to play within structure he had to learn to get through some reads so it did help him I think a year ago we were talking about like that's a late round pick. Now we we might be talking about a third round pick because after those six that we talked about, there's a pretty sizable drop off. There are still teams that need quarterbacks and there are still teams that are going to miss out on those top six guys and say, you know, like if you're Sean Payton, do you take Bo Nix at 12 or you draft Spencer Rattler in the third round? You know, like for your offense, which would you rather have, you know, or, you know, if you're the New York Giants and you, you know, at six, if you don't want to, if you don't get one of the top four quarterbacks at six, 
you got to add somebody at some point. And so I think Rattler is going to find a good, a good landing spot in a situation like that. You know, don't sleep on the LA Rams. Matt Stafford is a sneaky 36 years old and has had some pretty significant injuries the last few years. The Rams right now don't have like a, they don't have a long-term plan after, after Stafford. So I, I could see Sean McVay falling in love with Rattler's arm and saying, all right, we can, we can work with this. Stafford's tricky though. Cause he just keeps getting better and better looking as he's he ages. Wild. Like wild. he's so much better looking than when I played with him in Detroit. I'm like, what do you, uh, I guess that maybe comes with living in LA. I don't know, but I, I so I got to move. Yeah. Yeah. No kid. I'd never mind. I would never move to LA. Uh, that that's a completely different discussion. But the wide receiver class, so much conversation about not only the top end talent, right, of the guys that are going to go in the first round, but just it, it sounds like this is an extremely deep group of wide receivers. Yeah. What? D- just how deep is this draft at wideout? I've never seen anything like it. And that's like wide receiver is my favorite position to scout. I've never seen anything like this. I have seven guys in the first round. I have eight or nine guys in the second round. And it's just like, so in my top hundred, there's probably 19 or 20 wide receivers. So I've, I've never seen anything like that. And it's, it's fun this year because you have so many different types of guys. You know, you've got Marvin Harrison Jr. Who's six, three, you know, just like, he looks like AJ Green did coming out of college, but then you have, you know, the speed of Malik Neighbors and Xavier Worthy. And you've got, you know, guys like Brian Thomas Jr. and Adonai Mitchell who are like 6'4", running 4'3", 3", three, and they're these, you know, uh, they look like basketball players the way they track the ball. So there's really something for every team this year where some years we get a wide receiver class and they're all under six foot tall. Some years you get a receiver class and it feels like no one can run a sub 4'4". Four, four. This year there's a little bit of everything. So if you're looking for like that true X receiver – Several of those guys, you know, if you're looking for a slot guy that's going to just dominate on option routes, those guys exist too. So that's what not only are there, you know, the three guys at the top who are super talented, Harrison Neighbors and Adunze, but it's just the the top hundred is littered with really, really good wide receivers. You touched on this earlier. I just kind of wanted to circle back a little bit. I uh, it, it's It's not a deep talent pool. How much of that has to do with NIL? Because just like uh, in Oklahoma, yeah. Danny Stutzman, Billy Bowman, two guys that definitely would mm-hmm. have been drafted came back, and NIL had a lot to do with that. Is is this something – is this like a, a short-term trend and it's going to even out, or is this going to be something that's kind of new where the juniors are going to be lighter moving forward than really they've been in a long time? That's a great question. Um, it's definitely impacting things right now. I mean, you mentioned, I thought Studsman would have been the top linebacker in this class had he come out. Great for him that he doesn't have to. You know, it used to, like when you guys were in college, uh, I'm sure you had, a, and maybe you guys had to. I, mean, I know you had teammates that had to go to the NFL. They needed they needed the the money to, to go play football. Now it's, I can stay in college and make six or seven figures and work on my game. So it's, it's a huge part of it, you know. Um, Cam Ward enters the draft. It's like, nope, never mind. I'm going to go to Miami. You know, two, three years ago, that guy would have entered the draft. And Bo Nix, Jaden Daniels, they they would have never stayed in college that extra year. But NIL makes it feasible to do that. So uh, I don't know if it'll be long term. I feel like NIL, the rules change every month. So I don't really know, like, in a year what it's going to look like or in two years what it's going to look like. But I know it's having an impact right now. In my opinion, it's a good one. You know, guys staying in college longer is great for what I do. It's great for the NFL to have guys who are more developed. You know, I think it's also... You know, we were talking about Caleb Williams. It used to be a guy would get drafted early and you would say, how's he going to handle money? We don't have to worry about that anymore. Caleb Williams made a couple million dollars last year at USC. We know how he's going to handle money. And he already has the framework around him, you know, of like he's got a finance guy and he's got a, you know, he's got people around him taking care of that stuff. And not just Caleb Williams, all these top players do. So it also, it takes away some of that concern of, oh man, what's going to happen when this, you know, when the, the first million hits this bank account? It's already hit. So you you have that, you know, knowledge now of what guys are living like when they have some money in their pocket. That's that's an extremely interesting point, Matt. Now I always like to ask you this is a two parter prospect that <laughs> prospect you like more than maybe the other draft analysts, and then yeah. maybe a prospect you aren't as high on as some of the other draft analysts. 
I know the one I'm not as high on. That's easy. Uh, that's Drake May. And you know, I see some folks say like, oh, he's QB1. And I don't know that I work with anyone who says that, but I've certainly seen it. You know, where people are like, oh, he's QB1. I don't see that at all. I, I think he's more of like a developmental type quarterback. He's got really good tools. Absolutely. But, you know, he's got a lot that needs worked on. And I, I'm afraid he's going to get thrown into like a New England situation where that roster is so bad offensively. And he's going to, it's going to be like Bryce Young last year, where you're asked to be the savior and you got no answers around you at all. You know, New England has not really done anything in free agency to make me feel better about the offensive line or the wide receiver room, anything offensively. So um, Drake is the one that I would worry about. Hopefully, you know, like going to the Giants and sitting behind Daniel Jones for a year would be a great thing for him. And working with a Brian Dayball and a Mike Kafka, like that would be so good for Drake May. So hopefully that happens. The guy I like more than everyone else. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to scroll my list. Probably Quinion Mitchell, the corner from Toledo, uh, who's had a great senior bowl, great combine. He's just checked every box. And it's fun when it's a smaller school, like non-Power 5 guy who dominates everyone when you you get to watch him at the senior bowl. Because his tape was fantastic. I mean, there was a game in 2022 where he had four interceptions and he ran two back for, for touchdowns. You're watching this stuff, and you're like, okay, but doing it against like Northern Illinois. Can you really like? Does that work against LSU or does that work against Alabama? You see him at the Senior Bowl. No one could get off the line of scrimmage against this dude. So then we go to the combine. He runs a four three three at six foot two hundred pounds, and then the next day he reps out twenty bench reps at two twenty five. It's like right, like who does that? And so he's just handled the process really well. I I should have looked what you guys what your reps were at the combine. I, I think I did the same as Mitchell. I'm not proud to say that, but <laughs> you, hey. your arms are a lot longer. You got to remember that. Yeah, with, so. just, whatever you need to tell me to make me feel better. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. there, there's so much conversation about the QBs, the wide receivers, and the offensive tackles, and rightfully so. Right? There's a ton of talent in those groups, but who's your favorite defensive player in this draft? Oh, Dallas Turner, without a doubt. Uh, Dallas Turner from Alabama, which maybe that's cheating because he's plays at Alabama and he's really, really good, but. He, he's the guy that when I watch, I just think he's going to be a really good NFL player right out of the gate because he's got awesome first step quickness. He, he uses his hands well. He has really good length. But he's, he's a finished product. He's just a little undersized. He's 245 pounds. Put 10 more pounds on him, and it's you know picture perfect. So uh, hopefully you know he gets into a spot like Atlanta at 8, I think would be great for him to where he can develop a little bit. Chicago at 9 would work just as well, but he's, he's going to be a good player. Last one. Was it, was it harder to enjoy Texas going to the college football playoff, knowing that you lost to OU? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. I'm just that OU it. game, man, the OU game, it, this is a true story. I went and watched it with some of my friends. They're all Texas fans as well. And my wife uh, was, She's in nursing school, so she was doing, like, some homework and stuff. And it's like when the game was over, she was going to pick me up from this bar we were at, and she and I were going away for the weekend to celebrate her birthday. And at halftime, I'm like, this is going to be the greatest weekend ever. It's going to be great. And as you know, it ends up being a pretty bad game. So then wife and I go out of town for her birthday, celebrate it. And I like, it's all right. I, I was able to be mature and put it aside. I swear on the my children – that this happened. So fast forward, Texas makes the college football playoff. And we had already booked to go out of town again to the same damn place to camp in the mountains in Arkansas. Same damn place. So I get to watch Texas lose to Washington in the same place I was the night after Texas lost to Oklahoma. So we're never going back to that place, obviously. But uh, hey, it was it was enjoyable, hills. you know. That's where you want right? to be to heal and to get the mind and spirit back together. That's true. <laughs> that is true. But you know, like you know, this Gabe, I'm a Royals fan, and so that that teaches you how to suffer, and it also gives you perspective of sometimes you just got to be happy you made it and not even care. You know, like the I, when the Royals made the World Series in 2014 and lost to the Giants, I was just happy to be there. You know, so that's that's how I try to look at it now. Well, at least you got Bobby Witt Jr. signed up, man. At least. Yes, that's all. And, can't wait. And I know you days know this, in, but in three days. Can't wait. He's, he's got OU roots too, man. OU surrounds your life, whether you like it or not, Miller. <laughs> I know. I know, man. It's My daughter just got a job in, in Oklahoma, and I'm like, really? 
We, what, really? Why? Come on now. So yeah, and uh, Lorenzo Kane is my neighbor. Oh, well, there we go. So <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I love you guys. Three hundred sixty-four days out of the year. So I, uh, I love you, man. You're the best. I'm, I, I'm so excited for your success, man. You earn it. You, know, you, you work extremely hard and do a fantastic job. So lo- love seeing your face on ESPN all the time now, man. You're, you're killing it. We appreciate the time. Thanks, man. Yeah, of course. Anytime, guys.